True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Before we get started today, I just want to mention to everyone about last week's debacle. Well, I don't know that it was a debacle. Well, it woke me up in a panic in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> so if you listen to the podcast right away in the morning, or if your podcast app just um, automatically downloaded it, the first audio file that went out was incorrect, and it was unedited. Actually, it was worse than unedited. It was a mess. So... If you didn't like it and would like to listen to the real one, all you have to do is delete it and reload it in your podcast app. And I apologize. I just messed up. That's all. Sleep deprivation. Perhaps. Yeah, it was a long episode, so it was a lot of work. It was almost two hours. But anyway, I apologize for that. And let's move on with today's episode. Okay, this is about a doctor. Yes, I know. So hopefully you'll give us some insight. I'm hoping. The case of physician Michael Swango not only exposed the dark side of a man who had taken an oath to do no harm, it also opened our eyes to a professional environment where doctors accepted the word of fellow physicians over the word of nurses and patients, even as there was evidence of gross misbehavior piling up. Michael grew up in Quincy, Illinois, and he graduated as valedictorian at the Quincy Catholic Boys High School. He served in the Marine Corps, and he received an honorable discharge. He then attended Quincy College, followed by Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. His troubles were first noticed in medical school. Although he was a brilliant student, he preferred to work as an ambulance attendant rather than concentrate on his studies. Even at that young age, he had an odd fascination with dying patients. Michael Swango's patients often ended up coding or suffering life-threatening emergencies and several did die unexpectedly. So join us at The Quiet End today for a true story that actually is stranger than fiction. We're calling it Taking Lives, the Crimes of Dr. Michael Swango. We have a nice beer today, a good Ohio beer. I had lots of choices. I think Ohio was one of the first states where he was killing people, so I picked Ohio. Okay. Plus, I wanted to do this beer. First time I had it, it was mulled over to me by our friend Dave. It's called Hop Juju Imperial IPA from Fathead's Brewery. I love the name anyway. It's a great name. So this beer is a a big old Imperial IPA, or what you'd like to call a double IPA. Copper colored, big huge white head, nice lacing, one of those pretty beers. It has a citrus, fruit aroma, some tropical fruit, and pine. And then in the taste, some lime, some grapefruit, Kind of the pith of the grapefruit, you know, that bitter, more bitter part? Yeah, yeah. Uh, A little papaya, there's the tropical fruit, and some pine. Massive beer. It's uh, nicely bitter, so you got to be a hophead to like this one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's not one of those new fruity ones. This (laughs) is uh, more of a traditional, good-tasting beer. Okay. Just as a funny aside, I always thought that that bitter taste was the... um insecticides on the grapefruit that made it taste that way. Oh, no. Yeah, I did. But now you're educating me. Sure. All my, right. My pleasure. <laughs> You've done it a lot. Let's open the beer. Okay. At the quiet end today, quite a few people around. Hopefully we'll meet some interesting people. I mean, that's my favorite part of sitting at the bar is you meet new people and they're interesting. Well, I think that's the whole point. Yeah. And, you know, I always go off when we go to places and there's TVs all over the place. You don't like that. I don't like that. I want to sit at the bar and have conversations with people. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I'm a big TV watcher, really, but I don't like that it interferes with conversation. And that's why we don't have one in our bedroom, because I feel like it interferes with the marital relationship, not to go into any more detail. But I think a TV in the bedroom is a bad idea. I made you blush. (laughs) (laughs) You got me there. Okay. All right, why don't you go ahead and start our story down here at the quiet end. Okay. Michael was the second son of Muriel and John Swango. 
He excelled at the private Catholic boys' high school he attended. He had brothers, Bob and John. They attended public schools. But Michael went to the Catholic boys' school because his parents considered him to be gifted. He was a model student, made the honor roll each year. He took an unusual interest, though, in the Holocaust, which had been covered in his world history course. Now, that might have been an early red flag. Well, it could have been, but let's be honest, a lot of us are fascinated by horrible things. That's Doesn't true. Doesn't mean we like it. All right, I'll give you that. But yeah, it's something to consider. He was also a talented pianist, and he spent evenings playing classical music for his mother. So here's another guy that was his mother's favorite. He can do no wrong. She would eventually become estranged from her husband, who was quite an alcoholic. But in her mind, Michael could do no wrong. So we might be looking at another golden boy. Yeah, well, she was in denial, as it turned out. I mean, we'll see this. Yes, yep. So in his 1972 yearbook picture, there's Michael in his band uniform, smiling, with thick blonde hair. His ambition in the yearbook was to be an Illinois state trooper. But as class valedictorian, he was sought after by top colleges. He decided to attend Milliken University, which is a small private liberal arts school in Decatur, Illinois, which is about a three-hour drive from Quincy, and he received a full tuition scholarship in music. Now, as he had in high school, he excelled at Milliken, earning nearly perfect grades during his first two years. During his first year, a girlfriend broke up with him, he had typically worn a sports jacket to class, but after the breakup, he began to dress in military fatigues. He then painted his car in camouflage greens. So when a friend asked him about this, he said he planned to join the military, and he was fascinated by guns. So maybe the breakup with the girlfriend set something off in him. I'm not sure. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of a moment in his life. Yeah, like he kind of reacted to that in a certain way. Yeah. And about this time is when he first mentioned his interest in taking pre-med courses. He began to show an intense interest in car crashes, and he would save gory photos in a scrapbook. By the end of his sophomore year, he was spending more and more time by himself. And that summer, he left school and he enlisted in the Marines. So Michael finished basic training at the Marines boot camp in San Diego, where he was trained as a rifleman, and he earned the designation of a sharpshooter. In 1976, he received an honorable discharge. When he returned to Quincy after this discharge, he was very fit and lean, and he was carrying himself with more confidence. He announced then to his family that he wanted to become a doctor. And this, of course, was something that really pleased his mother. She'd worked as a medical secretary, so she really looked up to physicians. He then enrolled in pre-med courses at the local community college, and then he had no difficulty getting admitted to the Quincy College for the following fall. With his near-perfect grades at the more competitive Milliken, as well as his exceptional high school record, he must have been one of the college's top applicants. But still, after he was admitted, he did make a decision to embellish his records. On a form he submitted to the college's public information office, he falsely claimed that he had received both a Bronze Star and a Purple Heart when he was a Marine. So I don't know why he felt compelled to do that, because he certainly would have been accepted anyway. He would have been, right? But this was, this was a compulsion in him. Yes, he exactly. He always, always had to appear better. He did. So he was kind of a pathological liar in that respect. He certainly was. Now, Michael abandoned music and became deeply involved in science classes. He had a double major in chemistry and biology. But in contrast to high school... He wasn't involved in any extracurricular activities. He did begin working part-time as an orderly at Blessing Hospital in Quincy, and became a certified emergency medical technician, EMT. During his senior year, he wrote a paper on the poisoning murder of a prize-winning Bulgarian writer living in exile in London. He was fascinated by the murder, which was poisoning by ricin, that took four days to kill the writer. So very fascinated with poison. And during his senior year, he took the MCAT, the Medical College Admission Test, and he applied to several medical schools. He graduated summa cum laude in 1979, and he won the American Chemical Society's Award for Academic Excellence. 
Competition for admission to any accredited American medical school in 1979 was very intense. And it had been since the baby boom generation began graduating from college in the late 60s. It's kind of like that now, too, isn't it? Very competitive. Oh, I think it's way worse now. Might be. I mean, when, when I applied to medical school, it didn't seem that difficult to get admitted. Yeah, but you were like the perfect kid. Well, beyond that. <laughs> but, but now it's almost like you have to have published papers. Yes. Uh, you, you need to really be on the ball. You do. It's to major. Get, get into med school. I always joke about how I couldn't have gotten into medical school this, this day. That's not true, though. It might not be, but I certainly hadn't published papers or anything. Well, I mean, that wasn't something people were doing. I'm sure if that was the thing, you would have done it because you did the thing you were supposed to do. That's you. Well, I got admitted. <laughs> okay. But demand for doctors was strong, and lucrative careers were almost guaranteed for the graduates. Plenty of applicants with good records were rejected from every medical school that they applied to, and many were even going to foreign countries, like Mexico was a common one. Besides needing outstanding grades in the pre-med curriculum and the high MCAT scores, applicants had to sit for a personal interview in which their maturity, their commitment, and their aptitude for medicine were judged. So Michael's mother, Muriel, was proudly telling family members that Michael had been accepted at several medical schools, but his classmates had speculated that Swango had been admitted from the waiting list because he moved into the dorms late, along with students who had been admitted at the very last minute. So this was at uh, Southern Illinois. That's the one he, go he went to, yeah. Yeah. So they guessed that Michael hadn't performed well in the admissions interview because his grades were really good. And they all wondered what he would have answered when he was asked why he wanted to become a doctor. Because Swango had never mentioned to his classmates any interest in patients or helping or anything that most doctors would say. Yeah, he didn't have the stock answers ready. No, he was different. Certainly was. Now, in medical school, pathology fascinated Swango. Now, pathology includes toxicology, the study of poisons. So that, that might be a tip-off why it fascinated him. That's up his alley. His study habits weren't very good because he continued working for the ambulance service that he had started doing in college, and he was frequently unavailable. In many ways, the ambulance work seemed to be a priority to Swango. Yeah, and one of the first clinical assignments that medical students had was to take histories and perform physicals, or H&Ps as you call them, on the hospital patients. Students would interview patients, record their medical histories, and do physical exams. Then they would post the results on the patient's charts. So depending on the patient, the procedure could take anywhere from a half hour to 90 minutes. Or even longer. I mean, mm. if, if you're doing adult medicine and these people have umpty ump problems, I mean, it took me seven hours once to do a history and physical as a med <laughs> student. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> well, his classmates, though, they observed that Swango was completing his entire rounds in less than an hour. Is that, ex is that pretty extraordinary? Unheard of. Sometimes spending as little as five minutes with one patient. You can maybe get away with that as an attending physician, but a medical student, you have to cover every base. So you tend to be far more thorough than anyone else. Oh, it was the same thing in nursing school. Like when you were a student, you had index cards with every medication, every side effect. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that is extraordinary that he only took five minutes. He certainly wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. Not even close. In at least one case, another student said that Swango had faked the entire write-up which isn't surprising when you think of five minutes. He might have. And this claim triggered more concern about Swango with his classmates. In their third-year rotation, students can choose their area of specialization. And it came as a surprise to many in the class when Swango concentrated his courses in neurosurgery. Now, neurosurgery is one of medicine's most demanding and highly paid specialties, am I right? You're right. So competition for the internships and residencies was very intense wasn't something that people expected this guy to go into. No. You know, they, his, his classmates and, and a lot of the um, physicians who taught him thought he was a lazy, uninspired person. And weird. And weird. Yeah. But there was a neurosurgeon on the faculty, Dr. Lyle Wakaser, who raved about Swango. 
He never criticized Swango's alleged sloppy habits or indifference to patient care, and the two became inseparable. Swango would go to the neurosurgeon when he made rounds and would go to his surgeries. Swango even persuaded the nursing staff to page him on his ambulance pager whenever they learned that one of the neurosurgeon's patients was about to be admitted. That way, Swango was usually on the scene before the surgeon and even before sometimes the patients themselves. Now, of course, his eagerness made a good impression on Wachaser, who believed he was very pleasant and hardworking, and he thought Swango's patient write-ups were excellent. I think he was pretty good at faking it. Well, sure. And and you can put a whole bunch of bullshit into the write-up, and and unless the doctor or, or the attending checks the facts, it looks like you've done a great job. Sure. And this is third year, so I think there would be some trust in him. You have to trust someone at that point. You must think they've done okay to get to the third year of medical school. Right. But Dr. Wakaser was one of several doctors in private practice who also worked as clinical instructors. And he was very popular with students and respected in his field. The fact that he liked Swango really went a long way to quash student concerns about Swango's competence. So this helped Swango out a lot. Well, it certainly would. If you've got someone on your side in a high place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if you're thinking this guy's a lazy person, not doing the job, but you got a highly regarded attending praising him, sure. Yeah. Looks good. So during the third year of medical school, students were having much more contact with patients. Swango's classmates noticed that Swango seemed very interested in, even maybe preoccupied with, the sickest patients. The hospital had a large blackboard where they wrote patients' names and the treatment information. And when a patient that Swango had seen died, he wrote, died, in capital letters across the person's name. Other students found this distasteful, almost as though Swango was celebrating the deaths. So when Effie Walls, a kindly patient that Swango had been treating for an injury, died suddenly after getting a visit from Swango, he went ahead and scrawled died over her name. And when he was asked by another student if he didn't feel bad that the woman had died, his answer was quite alarming. He said, no, that's just what happens. Not very feeling. No. So Swango soon got this nickname, 00 Swango, like 007, License to Kill. And it was dark humor, but there was a lot of truth to it. We'll see, of course. We certainly will. So working with the ambulance company would bring Swango into regular contact with victims of car crashes, heart attacks, and violent crime. Now, his fellow paramedics, many of whom thought highly of his work, couldn't help but notice his unusual fascination with violent death. They had all seen his scrapbooks. They often saw him cutting out articles while waiting for an ambulance call. Now, once a co-worker asked him why he clipped and saved the articles, and Swango said, If I'm ever accused of murder... The scrapbooks will prove I'm not mentally competent. This will be my defense. That's pretty weird. It's very weird. And of course they took it as a joke, but there's a lot of truth to it, I suppose. He really liked to play games by hinting at his psychopathic tendencies. When an out-of-work security guard shot up a McDonald's in California in 1984, killing 21 people, Swango watched on CNN and he told his co-workers... Every time I think of a good idea, someone beats me to it. Now the other paramedics hoped he was kidding. For years, he kept scrapbooks of newspaper clippings about grisly car crashes and violent crimes. He was also fascinated by Ted Bundy, and he expressed his happiness when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty. With maybe a creepy kind of self-awareness, he once said, Sometimes I feel I have an evil purpose in my life. True words. But unfortunately, no one really took him seriously. Yeah, but without his fixation on violent death, it would be hard to understand why he commuted during his first year of medical school to work these 24-hour shifts at an EMT job that paid just 10 cents an hour above the minimum wage. I mean, you'd think he'd be studying. Yeah, he enjoyed it. There was a thrill in it for him. Yeah, and Swango told his fellow paramedics that he could handle the schedule because he lived on only two to three hours of sleep per night. His co-workers in the ambulance service were amazed that Swango would sleep for about 30 minutes, then jump up and work for 12 straight hours, often manic with energy. But his work on the ambulance did take a toll. One day he was so angry that he kicked in a cabinet door in the kitchen area of the ambulance headquarters. 
And to no one's surprise, or at least not to my surprise, his long hours also affected his performance as a medical student. Well, how could it not? I mean, well, most people in medical school just go to medical school. Exactly. Yeah. Now, some of his fellow students noticed he was poorly prepared, careless, and negligent. He'd rush from one class to another, interrupting his work whenever his pager went off for an ambulance run. Still, when he got ready to prepare for internships and residencies or postgraduate training, Swango had a glowing letter of recommendation from Dr. Wachaser, which he sent to about 10 teaching hospitals. Even Wachaser was surprised when, told him, when Swango told him that he had been accepted for a prestigious internship in neurosurgery at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics in Iowa City. Yes, yeah, so his postgraduate career is secured. So he pretty much gave up any pretense of being interested in his medical studies anymore. He really indulged his sick fascinations at this point, with car crashes and other emergencies. All he had left was this eight-week rotation in obstetrics and gynecology. This was a requirement, of course, that most students completed before their last year, and that they had to pass in order to graduate. But rather than taking OBGYN early, Swango had opted for a more difficult surgery and medicine rotation, and he was already concentrating on neurosurgery. Students were also required to attend OBGYN surgeries like C-sections and hysterectomies, but Swango never showed up. All examinations in the rotation were conducted orally, and he missed most of those, too. So the chief was rightfully concerned by Swango's complete disregard of the school's requirements. When she tried to locate him, she was told that he was working as an EMT. That kind of shocked her. She also heard that he had been banned from any direct patient contact on the ambulance. But she didn't ask why. I don't know why she didn't. When she finally contacted Swango, she asked him to do a history and physical on a patient who was scheduled to have a C-section that day. So she saw him enter the patient's room, and he left just 10 minutes later. She was surprised when he turned in a really impressive three-page write-up on the patient. She visited the patient to ask about Swango's visit and learned that the woman had barely talked to Swango. He hadn't done a physical exam at all, either. So the chief resident took her findings to the OBGYN faculty, and they had a meeting to consider his status. The faculty members were appalled and angry at his misconduct as well as his dishonesty, which was really posing a threat to a patient's health. So they made the decision to fail Swango, which meant that he wouldn't graduate in his class. And that didn't sit well with him. <laughs> no. So when he learned that he was going to fail OBGYN and wouldn't graduate, he was enraged. He hired a lawyer, and administrators at the school were worried that he would sue the school. Then Dr. Wachaser came to Swango's defense, saying that he had been an outstanding student and the charges he was lazy or hadn't done his assignments were not believable. Swango's professor of pathology and toxicology became so worked up over the injustice of failing Swango that he literally cried. So he was able to get people on his side when he really wanted to. He was. And then a few students, a few of his classmates, also argued that to fail Swango was too severe a punishment. It was noted that while medical schools reject hundreds and thousands of applicants, they almost never expel them once they've been admitted. Well, I guess the experience of medical school ordinarily creates kind of a strong bond. So it was kind of stunning when a group of Swango's classmates wrote a letter to the faculty stating that he was incompetent. He hadn't progressed at all during their years together, they said. He showed no interest in the patients. And his attitude toward medical education really seemed to border on contempt. None of this group felt that they would ever want Swango to be their doctor. He was not, in their view, capable of functioning as an intern. So time was running out, and they felt that he really needed to be stopped before he was out practicing. And that's unusual, right? Because usually med students stick together. They sure do. Just like doctors usually stick together and back each other up. Right. So for this to happen, I mean, Swango must have been really on the outs with his classmates. Right. It had to be super over the edge, right? Absolutely. So here, here we have kind of a problem, don't we? He's got a group of classmates that feel he's incompetent. He's got the OBGYN rotation that he failed miserably, but he has his supporters. Yes. 
And two doctors and a few students. High up supporters. Yeah, these doctors were high up, so I think their opinion probably mattered more than the group of students, to be honest. Yep. Now, the Student Progress Committee met in May 1982 with 10 committee members, two students, and eight faculty. In preparation for the hearing, the OBGYN chief resident had gone to the patient files to retrieve Swangle's report on the cesarean section patient, but it disappeared and it occurred to her that other reports by Swangle had been suspicious also. She looked for some of them, but they also were missing. So she reported this to the committee. She also testified about Swangle's performance in the OBGYN rotation, including his absences and presenting the evidence that he had fabricated at least one patient's history and physical. And other allegations surfaced, including his work as an EMT and his fascination with violence. But there was no reference to any suspicious patient deaths or to the double O Swango nickname. Nobody brought that up in the meeting. No. And then Swango himself appeared in his own defense. He seemed earnest and charming. Now, he denied that he had failed to examine any patients or had removed any files. He denied plagiarizing or fabricating the cesarean patient's H&P. He explained that he had no choice but to moonlight as an EMT because his father had died earlier that year, and he was the sole support of his mother and two brothers. Now, most members of the committee, especially the two student members, were unmoved. One even called Swango a bald-faced liar. But his toxicology professor came to his defense. He sympathized with Swango's need to support his family and said other students in the class were unfairly picking on him because he was different. So the decision to dismiss a student would require a unanimous vote. Eight members voted to expel him, one abstained, and one voted to give him another chance. So he graduated. There were negotiations between the college's lawyers and Swango's lawyer, and there was a compromise that had to be reached, though. He wouldn't be allowed to graduate with his class, but he wouldn't be expelled either. He was required to repeat his OBGYN rotation, and he was also given assignments from some of the other faculty's strictest professors in other specialties. If he passed these assignments, he would be allowed to graduate. If not, he would be dismissed. So at this point, he became a model medical student. He repeated the OBGYN rotation, attended all the required surgeries and oral examinations, and completed all of his assignments. Right. One of the other fallouts from this was that the uh, hospital in Iowa City rescinded his internship, so he had to scramble around. Right, right. And the director of the Department of Neurosurgery at at Ohio State University in Columbus offered Swango a residency in neurosurgery pending the successful completion of a year's internship in general surgery. So that year, Ohio State, one of the most prestigious residency programs in the country, had received about 60 applicants for its neurosurgery residence program and had invited 12 for personal interviews. Swango was one of them, and he was the only student offered a position. So what that says to me is he was really good at bullshitting. Yeah. He had to be. So he did graduate in April of 1983 and got a diploma in the mail. His mom, Muriel, was spreading the good news of his graduation and his acceptance at Ohio State to family members. Shortly after his graduation, he was fired by American Ambulance Company. He was already on probation because he'd had violent outbursts, but he responded to an emergency where a patient who was in acute pain and having a heart attack was gasping for air, and his instructions were to administer any emergency treatment called for and bring the patient in the ambulance to the nearest hospital. But instead, he made the patient walk to his own car, and he told the patient's family to drive him to the hospital themselves. The family called the ambulance company and complained. His behavior, of course, was medically unsound, and it was a clear violation of the rules. And he had no explanation for it, so he was fired. Well, he must have been very fortunate that the patient didn't die. Because he very easily could have. Yeah, and that would put him into deep trouble. Yes. Now, at Ohio State University Medical Center... Swango joined an elite group of medical school graduates for his first assignment as a surgical intern. Now, his first rotation was in the emergency room. It didn't take long for some of his shortcomings to surface. 
Every doctor in charge of a surgical rotation evaluates the interns at the conclusion of the rotation. Dr. Ronald Ferguson, who is the doctor in charge of transplant surgery, oversaw Swango's work from mid-October until mid-November, and he decided he was going to fail Swango because he didn't believe he was competent to practice medicine. Swango also alarmed at least one other of his supervising physicians with remarks that showed a fascination with Nazis and the Holocaust. Some of the residents who spent far more time with Swango than the attending physicians did also complained to the doctors on the faculty that Swango was weird. Now that covers a whole host of things, doesn't it? Weird. Yeah, well hopefully they were more specific, but nothing really came of it is the problem. So while making rounds, residents give interns tasks and then they critique their performance. Whenever they criticize Swango, he would drop to the floor and do push-ups. And he could do hundreds of them. Remember, he had been a Marine. So it was like he was still in the Marines, and this was his self-imposed punishment. But this didn't seem appropriate for a doctor making rounds in the hospital. He was asked to stop, but he refused, and he continued this behavior. That just mystifies me. (laughs) Yes, you're making rounds. So there's medical students, interns, residents, attending physicians, maybe a fellow in, in the program. So there's a flock of doctors yes, or doctors in training making rounds and, and to have one guy suddenly drop and give 25 push-ups that's beyond strange yeah it really is and that's just the beginning things get stranger but let's take a minute here just to talk about our sponsors then we'll get back to it okay today's episode is sponsored by adt real protection when it comes to something as important as your family's safety you deserve real protection from adt For me, Real Protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is standing by and there for you when you need them. Real Protection means having a safe and smart home with everything from video doorbells, surveillance cameras, smart locks, lights, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors, in a system that is custom designed to fit your lifestyle. In setting up custom automations to do things like lock the doors and set the thermostat when you leave. Real protection means staying safe on the go, in the car or when your kids are at school, with the ADT Go app and an SOS button. Real protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. Real protection means direct connections with first responders. No matter how you define safety for you, your family, or your business, ADT is there. ADT Real Protection. Visit ADT.com forward slash podcasts. To learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home that's just for you. Take coloring your hair to the next level with one of my favorite beauty products, and that's Madison Reed Hair Color. For as long as I can remember, there were two options for coloring my hair. The outdated at-home color, the stuff you pick up at the grocery store or the drugstore, you know what I mean. Or the considerable financial and time investment of going to the salon on a regular basis. We're busy women, and you shouldn't have to be rich to have multi-tonal hair coloring that's crafted by the masters. What makes Madison Reed Color unique is that it's crafted by the master colorists who know how to blend nuances of light, dark, cool, and warm to create over 45 gorgeous multi-tonal shades. You do deserve gorgeous professional hair color that's delivered right to your door for less than $25. Now many Madison Reed clients have commented, on how their new hair color has improved their lives, and I readily count myself among these clients. Madison Reed gives me gray-covering, game-changing blonde hair that I can maintain at home, looking like I came from the salon. I really thought I was chained to these monthly salon visits for life, and I never thought I'd color my hair at home again, but Madison Reed has truly liberated me. My hair is shiny and healthy, and I get this quality, nuanced color with the convenience of home delivery, which is my favorite. That's why I'm happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. And you can join me in finding your perfect shade by going to madison-reed.com. True Crime Brewery listeners also get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using our code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. And I'd like to take a moment here to let everyone know about a new podcast now available from Parcast. It's called Hostage, and it has fascinating topics. 
As you may know, behind every hostage situation, there is a complex dynamic between hostage, captor, and negotiator. Well, yeah, just say the wrong thing or make a wrong move, and the hostage's life is in jeopardy. Talk about pressure. I mean, really, there isn't enough Xanax in the world for me. Every Thursday, the Parcast Network's podcast, Hostage, tells these complicated stories behind the world's most intense hostage situations and the people inside them. Hostage explores the psychological tactics used in hostage negotiations and what the human brain does when a person is held captive. I really love that kind of in-depth examination. You can hear how hostage situations transpire and what strategies negotiators employ to find a peaceful solution. Well, yeah, but unfortunately, things don't always end peacefully. And Hostage highlights the moments in history when things did go tragically wrong, in addition to the techniques that have saved lives. Be sure to catch the astonishing two-part episode on Captain Phillips of the MV Maersk, Alabama, and check out how it all began with a thrilling three-part episode on the Patty Hearst kidnapping. Search for and subscribe to Hostage wherever you listen to podcasts. And please don't forget, it really helps to rate and review. Let's get back to our story. So when Swango was first uh, hired, no one from Ohio State called anyone at his med school to ask why he had graduated a year late. Remember, he had failed the OBGYN rotation, so he had to take that and do some other assignments in order to graduate. So he did graduate a year later than his classmates. Yeah, and supposedly he told his mom that it was a computer glitch that caused him to graduate late. And she believed it, of course, because he could do no wrong. That's right. No one seemed to have noticed that he should have graduated a year earlier than he actually did. But with a negative report from Dr. Ferguson and other comments about Swango's odd behavior, an attending physician called the Associate Dean for Medical Education. He was told that they should have seen warning signs in Swango's letter from the dean. Still, no one seemed to consider terminating his internship. Not at all. In January 1984, Swango was warned that he had a failing evaluation from Dr. Ferguson that might threaten his residency. The offer of a residency in neurosurgery was contingent on successful completion of the one-year internship. But Swango did seem appropriately concerned at that point. Well, sure. (laughs) He became very charming and humble and he asked for strategies to overcome the negative review and continue with this residency. He appealed Dr. Ferguson's evaluation to the Residency Review Committee, which was made up of doctors from the surgery department, and the committee met later that month to reevaluate him. Now, in the meantime, Swango found a girlfriend. This was a nurse, Rita Dumas. The relationship surprised many on the nursing staff because Rita, let's face it, she wasn't a catch for a handsome young intern. Plus, she was divorced with three young children. She always complained. She worked the night shift, got home at 7 in the morning, just as her kids were waking up. Rita said she was never able to get enough sleep, which might have been some accounting for her bad moods. Well, yeah, I can see that wouldn't be an easy life. But she really did seem to blossom in her relationship with Swango. She still kept mostly to herself, but she seemed more confident, and her overall attitude toward life seemed to improve. Of course, she'd been going through a difficult time, but Swango was very supportive, and she also said he was great with her kids. In early February, head nurse Ann Ritchie reported for the morning shift, and she was assigned a neurosurgery patient named Ruth Barrick. Now, Ruth was a pleasant elderly woman who had been admitted to the hospital a couple weeks before. She had fallen and hit her head at home and suffered a cerebral hematoma. So her condition was serious, but it had never been considered life-threatening until she suffered a respiratory arrest and nearly died on January 31st, just after Swango's appeal of his negative evaluation had been rejected. No one told Ann Ritchie what had happened, but on January 31st, another nurse named Deborah Kennedy had given Ruth Barrick her breakfast and assessed her, and she seemed to be doing well. She was sitting up in bed. She was talking and responding appropriately. Around 9.45 a.m. that morning, Dr. Swango had come into her room, and he told Deborah Kennedy, I'm going to check on her. Deborah thought this was weird because the doctors rounded early, like around 6.30, and they didn't return unless there was a problem. But, you know, he's the doctor, he's the boss, so she left him in the room with Ruth Barrick. Alone. Yes. About 20 minutes later, Deborah returned to check on Ruth. Swango was gone, and the patient seemed to be asleep. 
but when she got closer to the patient, she noticed that she was barely breathing and she was a bluish color. So Deborah did what you do. She called a code over the intercom, and doctors came rushing to the room. Swango was the first one to respond, but others, too, began working on this resuscitation. And after 45 minutes, her vital signs had stabilized, and she was transferred to the ICU. She recovered, and she returned to her regular hospital room. But then, on February 6th, Ann Ritchie was giving this same patient, Ruth, a bath. The patient was alert, talking cheerful, and seemed to be recovering. But Ritchie noticed that her central venous pressure was low in the central line. Want to explain that a little bit for lay people? A CVP line? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a line that's put in usually around the, into the jugular vein. Uh, and, and you advance the catheter into the vena cava, the big vessel that takes blood back to the heart. Now, what you can do with a line like this is you can monitor pressure, blood pressure, basically, and you could administer meds to it. So to be told that the uh, pressure in the CVP line looked low might mean that the patient needed fluid or something like that, that she was dehydrated. Okay. Well, she called to have a doctor check the line, and then she left the room to check her other patients. And a few minutes later, Swango entered the room, and she remembered feeling relieved that an MD had responded. But time passed, and she didn't see Swango come out of the room, which made her think there was a problem with the central line. Anne went back into the patient's room to see if Swango needed some help. Now, oddly, he'd drawn all the curtains around the bed, so neither roommate nor anyone passing the room could see what was happening. This was very odd. The nurse peeked in through the curtains, and Swango was hovering over the patient's chest, and he seemed startled by her. She asked him if he needed any help, and Swango said no, so she left the room again. Then ten minutes later, she peeked in again and asked if he needed any help, and he said no again. Just three minutes later, Nurse Ann Ritchie returned, opened the curtain, and looked in, and this time she saw that Swango was using two or three syringes, and one was stuck directly into the central line. If Swango had been using the syringes to clear the line, there should have been some blood in them, but there was no blood in these syringes. Swango said he needed no assistance, and Ritchie left the room again. And a few minutes later, she did see Swango leave the room. She assumed that whatever had been wrong with the central line had been corrected. And almost immediately, she went in to check on the patient. She wanted to check the central line dressing. But she was shocked because Ruth Barrett had turned blue again. She gave a gasp, and then she stopped breathing altogether. So as the resuscitation efforts began, the nurse looked up and she saw Dr. Swango. He was coolly watching her from the back of the room kind of a weird look on his face, doing nothing to help the patient. So she was trying to give mouth-to-mouth to the patient. This was years ago, I guess, before they had the masks available all the time. And Swango said to her, that is so disgusting. Other nurses and doctors rushed in and began chest compressions, but Ruth Barrick was dead. The last entry in her progress notes was made by Swango, and it read, patient suffered apparent respiratory arrest, witnessed by RN. No pulse present, code blue called. Patient did not respond to resuscitative measures, pronounced dead at 1049. Dr. Joseph Goodman and family notified. Swango. The death certificate cited the cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest due to cerebrovascular accident, which means that they signed her off as having had a stroke. So Anne Ritchie, the nurse, was appalled when Swango insisted he wanted personally to convey the news of the patient's death to her family members. She was almost certain that something Swango had done had killed her. Still, she never imagined that he might have killed her on purpose. She assumed that maybe he had accidentally allowed an air pocket to enter the central venous line, causing a fatal embolism in the bloodstream. This did sometimes happen, which was one of the reasons only doctors were allowed to adjust central lines. But Swango didn't acknowledge any error. And what was he doing with those syringes? Good question. Very good question. Now, these were still in the nurse's mind that afternoon when she responded to an urgent call in another room. There was another nurse, Amy Moore, who was with a patient having breathing trouble. And Swango was also in the room. With the patient gasping for breath, Swango ordered the nurse to get a heart monitor. Amy Moore was stunned. Using a heart monitor would waste valuable time. It was rare for a nurse to correct a doctor, but the patient's condition suggested that she might have had a pulmonary embolus or blood clot in her lungs. Swango was adamant 
Amy Moore said she could handle the situation and she got the patient to the other floor, which probably saved her life. Well, and after her shift ended that day, Nurse Ann Ritchie just couldn't get these disturbing events out of her mind. Ruth Barrick's death, Swango's reaction to it, and how he seemed to be purposely jeopardizing another patient. And she started to consider that this was deliberate. So as soon as she could, she got off the highway and drove to her sister's house where she broke down in tears and told her sister about the patient and then about what had happened with the doctor. The next day, following hospital protocol that any irregular incidents should be reported to her immediate supervisor, Ann Ritchie told Amy Moore about her suspicions that Swango had caused Ruth Barrick's death on purpose. She also talked with several other nurses about what had happened. She was afraid to mention that he was deliberately trying to kill patients, but that's what she was thinking. She certainly was. That same evening, which was February 7th, Swango and several other doctors made their evening rounds, and they stopped in to see Rena Cooper, a 69-year-old widow who had had an operation that morning for a lower back problem, and Iwona Utz, age 59, who was scheduled for treatment for a brain tumor. So for 12 days, these two patients had shared a room, and they'd become friends. Cooper, a former seamstress, and Utz, a former practical nurse, Cooper had described herself as a born-again Christian, and Utz was religious as well, so they had a lot in common. On the evening of February 7th, they had dinner, they watched TV, and they were talking about the Bible when the doctors showed up. The doctors noted that there was nothing unusual with either of the women and continued their rounds. When they left, Cooper was lying comfortably on her side with IV antibiotics infusing in her left arm. About an hour later, between 9 and 9.15 p.m., an Ohio State nursing student, Carolyn Berry, came for a routine hourly check, and she was surprised to see Dr. Swango there. Cooper had requested more pain medication, asking Utz, her roommate, to hold the call button down for her because she couldn't reach it, and Swango had apparently responded to this call. He was standing at Cooper's bedside, about three feet away from the student nurse, and the student noticed that he was adding something to Cooper's IV tube, something in a syringe so she assumed Swango was clearing a blockage. Barry stepped outside to enter data on Utz's chart, but then about two minutes later she heard Utz yelling, Are you all right, Mrs. Cooper? Then Barry heard the bed rails rattling, and Mrs. Utz was screaming, so she rushed to the room, and Cooper was turning blue and had stopped breathing. So the student nurse rushed to the nurse's station for help, and she returned to the room with a nurse named John Sig and Sig went ahead and called a code. Two doctors, Reese Freeman, the chief resident in neurosurgery, and Arlo Brakel, another resident, were the first to arrive along with several nurses. Swango, even though he'd just been in the room, didn't respond to the code right away. As the senior resident, Freeman took charge of the code, and he asked Beery, the student nurse, what had happened. She did tell him that Dr. Swango had been there and he had left. And Freeman was really surprised because doctor's rounds had been done earlier and Cooper wasn't scheduled for any follow-up visits from the physicians. Then Beery told him that she had seen Swango giving Cooper something through the IV tube, but the doctors seemed skeptical. So Beery was convinced that they didn't believe her. I mean, after all, she was just a student nurse. Nurses, not doctors, though, adjusted regular IVs. While doctors may inject certain special drugs into IV lines, Cooper didn't have anything scheduled that would have needed to be given by a physician. So as nurses went to calm down Utz, she called out that a doctor with blonde hair had done something to Mrs. Cooper. Between crying and sobbing, she said that the blonde-haired doctor had come into the room with a syringe with something yellow that you wrap around your arm when you draw blood, like a tourniquet. She had heard him tell Cooper that he was going to give her something to make her feel better, and Utz said she had watched the doctor wrap the yellow tube around Cooper's arm, inject her with something from the syringe, and run from the room. That's when Cooper's bed rails began to shake, and Utz tried to press her emergency call button but couldn't reach it, so that's when she screamed for help. But by the time Utz had finished her story, they moved her to a private room down the hall, so it was only nurses that heard the whole story. And Mrs. Cooper wasn't breathing. She was unconscious, But she wasn't dead. She had a nice regular heartbeat. The doctors checked her pupils and they noticed that there was some reaction to light. But they were surprised by what they called her total flaccidity. She had no reflexes. They intubated her because she wasn't breathing. 
Uh, and usually this is a procedure that's done under some degree of sedation. Yeah, you're putting a plastic tube down someone's throat. Cooper had no reaction at all, and she was paralyzed. Yeah, no physical reaction to anything. Yeah. So Joe Risley, a nurse's aide, had responded to the code, and he was standing outside Cooper's room when he heard Beery, who was a friend of his, tell Freeman that Swango had injected something into Cooper's IV. He moved down the corridor and round a corner, checking to make sure there were no other patient emergencies while the medical staff was working on Cooper. As he neared another room, Risley saw Swango wearing his white medical coat come out the door. Risley knew Swango had just been in Cooper's room, and he knew of no reason he would be in that other room. But what really struck him, he said later, was the creepy look on Swango's face. Yeah, I think he described it as like a shit-eating grin. Now the two said nothing to each other as they passed, but Risley immediately went into the room that Swango had exited. And on the bathroom sink, there was an 18-gauge needle and a 10cc syringe with the plunger depressed. Now an 18-gauge needle is a big one. Pretty large, yeah. Lily Jordan, the charge nurse who supervised other nurses on the floor, was walking by and Risley asked her if anyone had been assigned to give an injection in that room. She said no. Risley asked her to look in the bathroom and pointed out the huge needle and syringe. So the two of them thought the location of this abandoned syringe was very odd. Since a sharps container, which was a box for disposing of used needles and syringes, was just behind the sink on the wall. Risley told Jordan that he had just seen Swango coming out of the room with a strange look on his face, and the significance of their discovery immediately sank in. Jordan took a paper towel, wrapped it around the syringe and needle, and put them in a cabinet under the sink. Meanwhile, Cooper's responding to resuscitation efforts, and within 15 minutes she was breathing on her own, and the paralysis throughout the rest of her body had resolved. The tube down her throat prevented her from speaking, but she gestured that she wanted to write something. Cooper wrote, He put something in my IV. Cooper was taken to the intensive care unit, and there she asked for the pencil and paper again. This time she wrote, Someone gave me some med in my IV and paralyzed all of me, lungs, heart, and speech. She was with it. I mean, she knew what happened to her. You don't have to be a medical person to know that some guy put something in your IV and then you can't breathe. Pretty easy for anyone to figure out. And as soon as the tube was removed and she could speak, Dr. Freeman asked her what had happened. And she told him that a blonde-haired man had ejected something into her IV. She had seen a syringe in his hand, but she said she'd never gotten a clear look at his face, so that's unfortunate. But the student nurse, Beery, was really believing that none of the doctors believed what she was telling them. Dr. Freeman asked her, though, to confirm that Swango had been in the room, and he ordered a blood test on Cooper to find out possibly what had caused this paralysis. Then he confronted Swango with this allegation that he had given Cooper an injection. Swango denied that he had even been in Cooper's room after the doctors finished their rounds. Later, after hearing more reports from nurses, though, Freeman again asked Swango if he was sure he had not been in the room and Swango repeated that he had had no contact with Cooper. With Cooper in the ICU and the crisis pretty much over, the nurses just sat down and couldn't believe what had happened. They felt that something had to be done about this. Nurse Black, who was the supervisor, told nurses Barry and Jordan to write down everything they could remember, and she did the same thing. The student nurse Beery wrote that Swango was in the room and it appeared that he injected something into Cooper's IV tube. Then their statements were collected and placed in a sealed envelope, which they left for the director of nursing to see the next day. She also told Jordan to retrieve that syringe and place it in her briefcase, which was in her office. Now, Moore was already concerned about the increase in the number of codes and deaths on the ninth floor in the last few weeks, so now she was beginning to link them specifically to Dr. Swango. Yeah, on January 14th, Cynthia Ann McGee, a young gymnast from the University of Illinois, had been found dead in her hospital room, unexplained. Six days later, 21-year-old Richard DeLong was found dead. A nurse said Dr. Freeman, who responded to the code on DeLong, was stunned by this sudden death. Another patient on the ninth floor, 43-year-old Ryan Walter, died unexpectedly on January 24th, after a nurse found him gasping for air and turning blue. Swango had been working on the floor at the time of all these deaths. 
So the nurses reported their concerns to administrators, but they were met with accusations of paranoia. Swango was cleared by a very cursory investigation in 1984. Still, his work had been so poor that he wasn't hired as a resident physician after his internship ended that June. That July, he moved back to his hometown of Quincy. He told his mom and relatives that he hadn't liked the doctors he worked with at Ohio State, and he planned to apply for a medical license in Illinois. And in the meantime, he worked as a paramedic for a few months before he resumed his medical career. So he was hired by the Adams County Ambulance Corps, despite the fact that he'd been fired from that other ambulance service. So I guess they're not communicating with each other about employees. Obviously not. So his hours were unpredictable and he often worked weekends, but he frequently made the eight-hour drive to Columbus to see his girlfriend, Rita Dumas, and her children. He would make this long drive to Columbus, visit with Rita for just an hour, and then drive back for work. So he could go as long as two days with no sleep. Right. Now, many of his paramedics soon began to notice that whenever Swango prepared coffee or brought food in, several of them would get sick, violently sick. Stomach, you know, vomiting, horrible pain. pain. Yeah. Then in October of that year, Swango was arrested by the Quincy Police Department, who found arsenic and other poisons in his possession. In August 1985, Swango was convicted of aggravated battery for poisoning his co-workers, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. Now, his conviction set off criticism for the investigation, which was admittedly poor, at Ohio State. A review by law school dean James Meeks concluded that the hospital should have called the police. It also revealed shortcomings in its initial investigation of Swango. Franklin County, Ohio prosecutors considered bringing charges of murder and attempted murder against Swango, but they eventually decided against it because they didn't have physical evidence. The blood test of patient Cooper was either lost or never done. Well, I think what went into this a lot was a lot of hospital politics, and it revealed a lot, like we said, about the medical profession and how they protect doctors. Right. And hopefully that's changed to some extent now. I think it has. Well, it has, and you still have to do the reporting, but there is the National Practitioner's Data Bank that should have information about a person. Well, yeah, this is the 80s, so hopefully information is much more easily shared now. Right. So in 1989, Swango gets released from prison, and he finds work as a counselor at the State Career Development Center in Newport News, Virginia. Now, he was forced out after being caught working on a scrapbook of disasters on work time. Then he got a job as a lab tech. He performed adequately there, but during his time there, several employees sought medical attention with complaints of persistent stomach pains. Around this time, Swango met Kristen Kinney, who was a nurse at Riverside Hospital. The two fell in love and planned to get married. Then in 1991, Swango decided to look for a new position as a doctor. Which he couldn't legally do. I mean, after that conviction, he wasn't allowed to be a doctor anymore. He had a felony conviction on his record. Right. So there shouldn't be any way he could get a job as a doctor. Well, he legally changed his name to Daniel J. Adams, and he tried to apply for a residency program at Ohio Valley Medical Center, and that was in Wheeling, West Virginia. So July 1992, he began working at Sanford USD Medical Center in Sioux Falls. In both of these cases, he forged the legal documents that he used to reestablish himself as a physician. He forged a fact sheet from the Illinois Department of Corrections that falsified his criminal record, stating that he had been convicted of a misdemeanor for getting into a fistfight with a co-worker and had only had six months in prison, rather than reality, which was five years for felony poisoning. Now, of course, this is an important omission because, like you said, states aren't going to grant a medical license to a convicted felon. A felony conviction is viewed as evidence in and of itself of unprofessional conduct. But he's faking things. And Swango also forged a restoration of civil rights letter from the governor of Virginia, falsely stating that he had committed no further crimes after his misdemeanor and was leading an exemplary lifestyle. Swango was able to establish a fairly good reputation at Sanford Medical Center, but in October he made the mistake of attempting to join the American Medical Association. 
So the AMA did a more thorough background check than the medical center and found out about his poisoning conviction. That Thanksgiving, the Discovery Channel aired an episode of Justice Files that included a segment on Swango. That's remarkable to me. Isn't it? With the AMA report and multiple calls from frightened colleagues, Sanford fired Swango. His girlfriend, Kristen Kinney, went back to Virginia afterwards. She had started suffering severe migraines. After she left Swango, the headaches stopped. So, I mean, I think we can draw a conclusion from that, that he'd probably been poisoning her as well. Well, they were living together, planning to marry, right? Yeah, he just got a kick out of it. It's really yeah, he's, he's a crazy a, case. A sick guy. Yeah. But the AMA temporarily lost track of Swango, and he managed to enter the psychiatric residency program at the State University of New York. His first rotation was in the internal medicine department at the VA Medical Center in Northport. But again, his patients began dying. Four months later, Kristen Kinney committed suicide. Now her mother, Sharon Cooper, was horrified to find out a person with Swango's history could even be allowed to practice medicine. She got in touch with a friend of Kristen's who was a nurse at Sanford. The nurse alerted Sanford's dean, Robert Talley, about Swango's whereabouts. So Talley contacted the dean and under intense questioning from the head of the psychiatry department, Swango admitted that he had lied about his poisoning conviction in Illinois, and he was immediately fired. Well, the public outcry that followed resulted in Drs. Cohen and Miller of the State University of New York being forced to resign. Before he resigned, Cohen sent a warning about Swango to all 125 medical schools and all 1,000 teaching hospitals across the U.S., so he prevented Swango from getting another medical residency in the United States, because I feel like he absolutely would have tried again. Well, well, of course. But the thing that's horrifying is that none of these hospitals did due diligence. Right. Um, Swango, as you said, was uh, an excellent conversationalist, and people wanted to believe him. Yes, I agree. And it, it would not have been very difficult to check references Oh, no. I and, mean, and find out what he'd been doing. Absolutely. But they didn't. They didn't. But I also believe that this was a time when people dealt more with paper. You handed them documents. Now I think everything's online, hopefully. And this would be much tougher to do today. Not that that excuses any of the terrible things that happened, because it could have been prevented. Right. Now, his latest incident was at a Veterans Affairs facility, so federal authorities got involved. And Swango disappeared. And then in mid-1994, the FBI found out he was living in Atlanta and was working as a chemist at a computer equipment company's wastewater facility. Soon after the FBI alerted the company, Swango was fired for lying on his job application. The FBI obtained a warrant charging Swango with using fraudulent credentials to gain entry to a VA hospital. But by the time the warrant was issued, Swango had left the country. In November 1994, he went to Zimbabwe, and he got a hospital job based on forged documents. And once again, his patients began to die mysteriously. It took a year, though, for the poisonings to be connected to him. Then he was arrested in Zimbabwe. He was charged with poisonings, and he hired prominent lawyer David Coltart. But he escaped from Zimbabwe before his trial date and hid out in Zambia. So this is a crazy story, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, out of it, this world. This is one of those truth is stranger than fiction things. Absolutely. So at that time, he rented a room from a widowed woman who ended up getting violently ill after she ate a meal in the house where he was. Now she consulted a local surgeon who suspected that she had arsenic poisoning, and he persuaded her to send hair samples for forensic analysis. These clippings confirmed toxic levels of arsenic in her hair. The lab reports were passed on to the Zimbabwe Republic Police Criminal Investigation Department through Interpol to the FBI, who then visited Zimbabwe to interview this pathologist. In the meantime, Swango had really figured out that the authorities were closing in, so he crossed the border to Zambia and then to Namibia, where he found temporary medical work. He was charged in absentia with poisonings. A year and a half later, in March 1997, he applied for another job at the Royal Hospital 
in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, using another falsified CV, of course. While all this was happening, criminal investigator Tom Valeri consulted with Charlene Thomason, MD, a forensic psychiatrist, to have her help him with the Swango case. Because of her clinical expertise, she was able to review documents and evidence, and she gave a psychological profile of Dr. Swango. Tom Valeri called DEA agent Richard Thomason, no relation, who was stationed in the Manhattan DEA office to discuss the case. His conversation focused on Swango lying on his government application to work at the Department of Veterans Affairs, where he prescribed narcotic medications. This and other evidence were enough for Immigration and Naturalization Service agents to arrest Swango in June of 1997. And the way they got him is he was stopping over at Chicago O'Hare International Airport on his way to Saudi Arabia. So Swango pleaded guilty to defrauding the government in March 1998. In July of that year, he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. The sentencing judge ordered that Swango not be allowed to prepare or deliver food or have any involvement in preparing or distributing drugs. A smart move. (laughs) Finally, someone does something smart. The government put together a massive file of Swango's crimes. As part of the investigation, prosecutors exhumed the bodies of three of his patients and found poisonous chemicals in them. They also found evidence that he had paralyzed Baron Harris, another patient with an injection. Harris had later lapsed into a coma and died. Prosecutors also found evidence that Swango lied about the death of Cynthia Ann McGee, the young gymnast he had been treating while he was an intern at Ohio State. Swango had claimed that she suffered heart failure, but he had actually killed her by giving her a potassium injection that stopped her heart. And that's easy to get access to as a physician. Oh, sure. Very easy. And it's one of those things that are pretty much untraceable. Yes. Unless you quickly do blood work and see that they have a massively elevated potassium level in their blood. But that usually doesn't happen. Right. So on July 11th, 2000, just a week before he was due to be released from prison on the fraud charge, federal prosecutors on Long Island filed a criminal complaint charging Swango with three counts of murder one count of assault, and one count each of false statements, mail fraud, and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. At the same time, Zimbabwean authorities charged him with poisoning seven patients, five of whom had died. Swingo was indicted in July 2000, and he pleaded not guilty. But on September 6th, he pleaded guilty to murder and fraud charges. If he hadn't done that, he had faced the possibility of the death penalty as well as extradition to Zimbabwe. At his sentencing hearing, prosecutors read some terrifying passages from a notebook of his, where he had described the pleasure he got from poisoning and killing people. He was sentenced to three consecutive life terms. Swango repeated the same methods to commit these murders. With non-patients, such as co-workers at the paramedic service, he used poisons like arsenic, slipping them into food and drinks. With patients, he sometimes used the same poisons, but usually he gave them an overdose of whatever drug the patient had been prescribed, or he even wrote out false prescriptions for drugs. So the book we mentioned earlier is Blind Eye, written by James B. Stewart. Excellent book. Very good. And in the book, they estimate that counting the suspicious deaths in med school, Swango is linked to 35 suspicious deaths. And of course, that can't be all of it. The FBI believes he might be responsible for about 60 deaths. But we do recommend this book. It's just fascinating, goes into excellent detail. We really couldn't have done the podcast without information we got from that book. Well, it's one of these books that you read and you just get angry reading it. Well, as a physician, it makes you angry. Because he's giving you guys a bad name. He sure is. (laughs) Doesn't make you look good, Dickie. No. No. Especially the way that he was protected. I don't like that at all. He was. You know, I'll only say that, I mean, you were talking about how it was years ago and things were different then, and it, it certainly was. Yeah. And these days, you would listen to nurses and non-physician employees when they have suspicions. You wouldn't summarily dismiss them. Hopefully not. But, you know, I think that not all doctors are like you. Some of them have big egos and don't respect nurses like you do. Well, that's because I'm a pediatrician. (laughs) 
that's, that's not. That's my excuse. I think that there's a certain personality type that goes into different specialties. Well, sure, to a certain extent, but I would hope that all physicians would respect nurses enough to listen to them. Absolutely. Especially when you have repeated complaints and suspicious activity by someone like this. I mean, there were many suspicious things about him. It wasn't just a one thing. There were so many things. That's right. But anyway, thanks for this discussion. Really an interesting case and a great book to read. Fascinating. Today's show has been sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. Real Protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is there for you when you need them. Real Protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. No matter how you define safety, ADT is there. ADT, Real Protection. Visit ADT.com forward slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for True Crime Brewery was written and produced by Tristan Capel. And this is the point in our show when I tell listeners about our members-only episodes, which we produce exclusively for our Team Tie Grabber members and our Patreon supporters. This past February, our members-only episode was about female serial killer Sheila Labar, who actually seduced, abused, and killed young men on her New Hampshire farm. And this month, actually within a few days, I believe, we're going to be recording our members-only episode on Robert Reldon. And this is a fascinating case. Dick has taken the lead on this one, and it's an amazing case. I really can't wait to talk about it. This guy was a serial rapist and murderer, a handsome, charming kind of guy. Reminds me a little bit of Ted Bundy. He had a friendly smile, and people trusted him. So for like 20 years, he committed crimes and got away with a lot of them. So we have a big backload of these episodes, including episodes on O.J. Simpson, Tina Watson, Robert Fisher, Clara Harris, and Diane Downs. If you would like to give some support to the podcast and get some extra episodes to listen to, you can go to our website, it's tiegrabber.com, and you can join. You can also go to patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber and become a patron. Our members and patrons also get a snifter or a bottle opener, some magnets and stickers as a thank you from us. One other thing, we always appreciate it if you could give a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show to help us find some new listeners. So let's get to feedback. If you have feedback and you want it read on TCB, you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrebber.com or tell us what's on your mind in your own voice by leaving a voicemail on our Leave a Voicemail tab, which is on the right side of the screen when you go to our website homepage. Either way you do it, we would love to hear from you. So the first thing we have in feedback is a voicemail from Shelby with a case suggestion. Hi, Jill. Hi, Dick. This is Shelby from Tacoma, Washington. I love your podcast, and I have a few case suggestions. The first one is the Skelton Brothers. Tanner, Alexander, and Andrew went missing in Michigan November 26, 2010. The dad said he gave the boys to an underground sanctuary due to the mom's pedophilia. Uh, The second case is the Van Breda murders. In Stellenbosch, South Africa, January 27th, 2015, it was a home invasion with an axe, killing three and leaving two alive with a very frustrating 911 call and a huge twist at the end. And the most recent is the murder of four-month-old Sterling in Iowa, August 30th, 2017. Um, A 21-year-old mom left her son in a swing with a blanket in a hot room. And when Sterling was found, unfortunately, he had passed away and there were maggots in his diaper. Um, I know how much Dick loves working with children, so I thought that would be a great case as well. I love the podcast and I cannot wait to hear more from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Those are some good suggestions. That last one's pretty disturbing, but, well, they're all disturbing, right? Well, I I think that I only put the first one out to talk about for today. I'm going to reserve the other two from Shelby. Okay, so the first one that you're talking about is the Skelton Brothers, which I've never heard of. No, and this is in your territory. These boys, three boys, I think five, eight, and ten or something, three little kids, went missing from Morency, Michigan, which is near Detroit, 
on Black Friday 2010. The parents were divorced or separated. Tanya Skelton said her husband, John, was supposed to return the boys to her, but he never did. John Skelton, meanwhile, always maintained that he'd given the boys away because his wife or ex-wife, Tanya, was abusing her sons. And she was later charged with misconduct for having sex with a 14-year-old boy in 1990. And she, of course, denied that she abused the boys, but no one's ever found them. So, so what about this guy saying he gave him away? There's no consequences for that? Is this one of these crazy cases where they just said, okay? I mean, what the fuck? Oh, I think he went to jail for a time, but they've never found him. I don't know. Again, I feel like if an adult loses children, quotation marks, they should be held responsible for killing the children because you don't give children away no. like that and they never show up again. I'm sorry. But it's just not a valid reason. Doesn't it sound like an interesting case? It does, yeah. Yep, I think that that is an interesting so, one. So, And yeah, I mean, all three of the suggestions that Shelby gave sounded fascinating. Yeah, good job. So She was very concise. She gave three of them. I liked it. Okay. Well done, Shelby. Thank you. Okay. The next voicemail is from Tracy. It's also a case suggestion. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Tracy from Iowa. I love your podcast. I listen to many true crime podcasts, and yours is one of my favorites. I have a case suggestion. It's about Jessica Lunsford. She was a nine-year-old in Florida that was kidnapped, raped, and buried alive by a disgusting sex offender. It's a really terrible case, and I'm surprised I haven't heard I haven't been able to find any other podcasts that have covered it. And then her wonderful father after that worked to get Jessica's law passed. And he and his family were initially harassed by people accused of killing Jessica. I would love to hear you cover this case. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. So I see that you have copious notes on this one. I know you were talking to me about this law. So do you want to say a few comments about this one, Dick? Sure. I mean, I'll abridge the notes a little bit, okay? Okay. But she was uh, murdered in February 2005. She's a little nine-year-old kid in Homosassa, Florida. and She was taken right from her home? Right from her home. A sex offender lived nearby. His name is John Cooey. And he apparently held her captive over the weekend, raping her and then murdered her by burying her alive. I think I've heard of this. So they tracked him down because he fled the state and was living somewhere else. But they found him and charged him and That's se good. sentenced him to death. But then he died of natural causes before his sentence could be carried out. Following her death, her father, Mark Lunsford, pursued legislation to provide more stringent tracking of released sex offenders. So the Jessica Lunsford Act was named after her, and it requires tighter restrictions on sex offenders, such as wearing electronic tracking devices, and increased prison sentences for some convicted sex offenders. Jessica's law refers to similar reform acts that might be initiated by other states. So he's been tireless in uh, getting this taken care of. Well, that sounds like a good topic. Yeah, and he's, as Tracy said, he got some blowback on this. From who? From the sex offenders. Oh, well, who gives you, a shit about that? You know, they said, I've served my sentence. I should be able to do what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. I'm... I'm simplifying this, but... Well, that is a whole other issue, how we deal with sex offenders, so... Yes. It is That's, an issue. So if we do this case, that might be something to discuss, right? Absolutely. I think that could be an interesting conversation to have. Okay. So I'm on board for that. Okay, those are our voicemails. We have a couple emails. First one's Christine. Christine has a case suggestion. She says that she loves our show and we're her favorite. So thanks, Christine. She says, as you spent a good amount of time in Maine, I wonder if you've ever looked into the Sabato, Sabino, Raya case. Back in the late 1990s, he went on trial for gunning down three unarmed men he claimed had followed him and his girlfriend to his home to harm them. Though one of the three was killed while clearly trying to flee, Raya was found not guilty at trial. Also, if you do look into that case, Dick should check out Four River Brewing. Although Preble, especially their sour cherry variety, is my fave, Estuary may appeal to Dick. Thank you, Christine. So what do you know about this, Dick? Well, I vaguely remember this because I was living in Maine at the time. Just to embellish a little bit, and I don't want to give too much away because this is an interesting case, but these guys, Raya owned a bar or a club or something in Portland, and these people 
came in and there was a loud argument between Raya and the three guys. And then when he left with his girlfriend, they followed him. And his defense was that he was fearful of his life because it had this quite boisterous argument beforehand. Did he have a cell phone so he could have called 911? Don't know. Because Maine doesn't have a stand your ground law, does it? Not specifically, but he said he acted in self-defense because he feared for his life. Although one of the suspects was trying to flee. Correct. So that would go against what he's saying. Yeah, but he was found not guilty. Wow. Well, see, I think that's one that would really frustrate me and upset me. But it would also have some interesting things to discuss, so it let's would. consider it. Plus, if we're talking about a sour cherry beer, I find that hard to turn down. Well, you've had that. Oh, have I? You have. Did I like it? You did. <laughs> good. Four Rivers is a pretty good brewery, and I've gotten a bunch of beers from them. I did buy you, it was maybe just a single can of it, because you used to be able to buy singles at the beverage place in Kittery. I like most Four River beers. Have you had Estuary? I have not had Estuary. I've had a couple of their IPAs, quite good. Okay. So that'd be something to think about. Good. Okay. One final case suggestion from Cindy. I edited her letter too. So Cindy wrote, I have read Anne Rule's book about the Deborah Green case. I have read all of her books so far and she's a great writer. I can imagine the shock she must have felt when she found out that her ex-co-worker Ted Bundy was a serial killer. Now, I think she was mentioning the Deborah Green case because that's something she just listened to when she wrote to us. Correct. Okay. So her suggestion is this, this is the next, next one. one. Okay. Yeah. As a high priority, I'm still very much interested in you covering a case I've mentioned before, the murder of Naomi and Jim Olive. This case is about the clash between teenagers and parents, especially parents who are old enough to be the child's grandparents. I was a late one as my mother was 43 when I was born and my dad was 55. So yes, I think this is interesting. We've both looked at this case, and it's definitely one that we want to cover. So they're also known as the barbecue murders? They are. All right, they're known as the barbecue murders because it was a double murder in Marin County, California, and business consultant Jim Olive and his wife Naomi were murdered in their home by their 16-year-old adopted daughter Marlene Olive and her 20-year-old boyfriend Charles Riley, who then attempted to dispose of their bodies by burning them in a barbecue pit at a nearby campground. Riley was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and received a death sentence, which was later changed to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Marlene Olive, who was 16, was tried as a juvenile and received a sentence of three to six years in the California Youth Authority Juvenile Facility. So she was released at age 21 after serving just a little over four years. This case gained worldwide attention due to the age of the perpetrators, of course, the details of the crime, which are grisly, and the wide disparity in sentencing between Charles Riley and Marlene Olive. This has also been the topic of continuing coverage in connection with his repeated bids for parole, and she's had subsequent convictions for numerous other crimes, which I find interesting. I would like to follow up on how she did after getting out. She's kind of a career criminal. But nothing violent. Not that we know of. But that reminds me of that that case we did in Canada a couple years ago. Yeah, Runaway Devil. Right. She was, what, 13? Yes. And as far as we know, she's she's been out for several years and has led a clean life. As far as we know. And I think there's a big difference, though, between 13 and 16. Yeah, you're right. As far as maturity. When I think about that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely an interesting topic, so certainly is. that's one we might want to pursue. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. So thank you to everyone for your emails and for your voicemails. And if you've sent us something and we haven't read it on the air yet, we may be, because Dick has a backlog, right? I do. Okay. So don't give up hope. <laughs> okay. Not that you would anyway. <laughs> no. All right. Well, we will see you next time at the quiet end. And thank you for listening. Come join us. Bye-bye. Bye.